So what I'm going to talk about now is a move that we did one year when we had a legal topic, and I think that you might find it useful in some limited circumstances, although I'm also going to tell you where you'll find the evidence to answer it. What we did is we said, we began with something that's commonly accepted in the field of argumentation, which is my academic field, which is that arguments are field dependent, which is to say that art critics arguing over whether a painting is a good painting use different kinds of reasoning and different, completely different configurations of arguments from, say, medical researchers who are arguing over the results of a test that they conducted on a new experimental medication. So it, that was an attempt to explain, it was an attempt by Stephen Toulmin to explain why the hundreds of years that philosophers have tried to come up with universal standards of true and false arguments, one of the reasons that that's been unsuccessful is it really depends on what the subject matter is. So we began by saying that legal argument, and in particular courtroom argument, is a field. It's its own field, and it has its own uh, field-specific argumentative constraints or argumentative conventions. And what we then did, and you can do a search for a phrase that just about any attorney would recognize, do a search for though the heavens fall. And what will come up is let justice be done though the heavens fall. And then there's a Latin version of it, which I haven't bothered to memorize, and I'd probably mispronounce it anyway. But the idea here is that attorneys will say that in court what you are after is the correct outcome. What you're after is justice. And if someone makes the argument that a ruling in this case will have consequences, secondary consequences set in motion by the ruling that are unfortunate, well, you don't consider those. The just outcome is the only thing that you're after. If the jury in the O.J. Simpson case decades ago if, if they had known that after their verdict was announced that there were going to be riots in the streets and buildings burned down and people killed, if they were sure that it was the right verdict, if they were positive that they needed to find him not guilty, whatever anybody else may think about whether that was the right verdict, should they have gone ahead and found him not guilty or should they have stopped and said, well, maybe let's find him guilty just because that'll stop buildings from being burned down and that'll stop people from being hurt? Well, that doesn't seem right. And that's kind of the kernel of the argument. What you can then do is you can say, you know, the negative can win their disadvantages with big impacts. They can win economic collapse. They can win nuclear war in the end of the world. But we are making an argument within an argument field. The topic asks a question based on the purpose of the institution. Now here you have to, you might have to make sort of a secondary step because one of the things the negative could say is, this kind of reform would be undertaken by a legislator, and a legislator does consider the consequences. A legislator is entitled to consider, will violent crime go up? Will there be a deterrent effect? And those are not narrowly focused questions of justice. But I think you could say, but we're talking about an institution, and that institution is, the proper configuration of it is determined by what its purpose is. So, like, one analogy that popped into my head is, would you keep razor-sharp butcher knives in a daycare center? Well, if you would, then your judgment's not very good. But would you ban razor-sharp butcher knives from a kitchen, say a restaurant kitchen, because they're unsafe for children? Well, no, you wouldn't do that because a restaurant kitchen is not a place for children. So if you're arguing over what is the proper role of justice in configuring what happens in a trial, in a courtroom, in a criminal justice setting, then you default back to those legal argument standards where the secondary speculative effects of a reform really aren't relevant. The only thing you have to win is that the outcome would be more just. And then, even if the negative can win a big impact disadvantage, you could say that you outweigh it because the field-specific convention in legal argument is let justice be done, though the heavens fall. Now, the answer to this is going to be a piece of cake because when you do a search for that, you're going to find a lot of people inside the legal field. You'll probably find three or four who attack that idea for every one who stands up for it. The ones who stand up for it, they will talk about brave attorneys and brave judges in the past who've lived that way. And in particular, there was one judge who freed one of the Scottsboro boys. And you can go back and do a little reading about the whole Scottsboro boys event back in the 1930s. And when he admitted, the judge, that this was probably going to end his career, he quoted, let justice be done though the heavens fall. And he's regarded as very much a hero these days. 
But just about everybody else who writes in a legal context about this idea, they say it's too inflexible. They say usually if we don't get sort of stiff-necked and stubborn about it, we can figure out a way to dispense justice to where those consequences don't come about at all. We can maximize everybody's interests and not bring the ceiling down on our heads in our determination to have it our way. So you might want to think about a way to narrow which arguments are relevant on the affirmative and maybe to do a little bit of research to get a defense for that idea that the consequences of the plan are not pertinent if you can win that it's a more just outcome. But as for what you're going to do on the negative, I think you can very easily come up with a lot of evidenced arguments to get at precisely that assumption, let justice be done though the heavens fall, is not really a tenable idea. So play with that and see what you come up with.